So this event pre presents a lot of really joyful moments for me as the department chair. It's lovely to see our students succeed and celebrate their awards. And I have to say, I am really, really pleased to introduce Dr. Elisa Bandera, who is our Saxon Graham lecturer for 2024. For me, it's a personal joy as well as a professional pleasure. Elisa and I trained at the same time. We shared an office during our doctoral studies, and she's always been a bright star. And now she has many leadership roles in cancer epidemiology. She's professor and chief of cancer epidemiology and health outcomes, co-leader of the cancer prevention and control program, the Unilever endowed chair for the study of diet and nutrition in the prevention of chronic disease, as well as the director of the Population Science Research Support Shared Resource at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And in her spare time, she's professor of medicine at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at Rutgers University. Her research includes the impact of obesity and body composition on breast and ovarian cancer risk, treatment outcomes, survivorship and prognosis, and all of this with a focus on cancer health disparities. She's led impactful epidemiologic cohort studies, contributed to public policy on cancer and nutrition, and particularly nutrition guidelines, and has served on numerous advisory committees and expert panels for national and international organizations, including the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the American Institute for Cancer Research, and the World Cancer Research Fund International. I'll share a personal reflection when the journal Epidemiology first started. Um, we were students at that time. And Elisa will remember the first ad for the Epidemiology Journal was a snap of the cover of the journal and it had all the articles, including one of hers. So she was like focused, she was, on, she was all over epidemiology, which was very exciting. So I'm very, very proud to introduce Dr. Bandera. She's an accomplished scholar and such an amazing leader among our distinguished alumni. So she's going to speak to us today on the evolution of nutrition and cancer prevention guidelines through a personal lens. So please give a warm welcome to our 2024 Saxon Graham lecturer, Dr. Elisa Bandera. Thank you so much. And I hope that you all hear me in the back and you, it's okay? Okay, good. So uh, where is my pointer? Here, right? I need to get my water. Perfect. So thank you so much, Pauline, for the introduction. I'm so honored. And I have to say, I remember when I was presenting my doctoral um, defense, I told Joe, do not say anything nice about me because you're going to make me cry. So I'm like, I was this close, okay? Because it's been amazing and seeing so many familiar places coming back to Buffalo. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of personal stuff. And then I start talking about the evolution of the guidelines. Um, just disclosures, I really don't have any conflict of interest, but full disclosure uh, about you know, my involvement, I'm going to be talking about WCRF, AICR, ACS. So I've been in advisory panels, but my, the views that I'm presenting are my own. Um, feels like a long journey, so I'm going to give you a little bit of context of when I came to Buffalo. This is where most people, even the people that know me well, don't know. This is where I grew up. It's a very small town called Junquera, um, 3,000 inhabitants, not many resources, beautiful to visit. And from there, it was, I couldn't even do high school there. So from there, I have to move to Ronda, which if you are in southern Spain, I recommend it. It's a gorgeous place to visit. And I did high school there, and then I have to move to Malaga to do, uh, I completed medical school there uh, at the University of Malaga. And from there, 
I came to Buffalo and I found the, the ID <laughs> so that you see how I look like, uh, very young. And also it was, you know, a recent immigrant. I was trying to understand American culture. Uh, I saw Karen Fagner is there, one of my friends <laughs> that, you know, I was trying to even speak English well, and I was like struggling. I took Joe's class and I'm like, I have to write in English or no, you know, how am I going to do this? So it was like a, an interesting experience. So I actually enjoy, um, was accepted for the master's program. My goal is to do a master's, but then during my first semester, um, I did very well. And Dr. Graham called, called me to the office and asked you know, questions like, oh, what, what are your directions? What do you want to do? And blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what the meeting was about. I thought, okay, maybe all the students meet, meet with the chair. So he said, well, if you tell me that you want to study cancer, I can offer you a postdoctoral fellowship because I had an MD. I was able to do my PhD with the fellowship. So it was a great opportunity that totally changed my life. And, and then here he is. Just, many of you have seen the pictures of us so young. And there it is me as a postdoc uh, in the picture. Um, I have to tell this story, Joe. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> So I was, uh, Joe Freudenheim was my doctoral um, dissertation advisor. And I went to her and said, Joe, I'm pregnant. And she said, so am I. So we had the same due date. And this is, uh, they gave us a secret baby showers. And here, here we are both very pregnant actually with the cake. And this is my dissertation defense. And it's, I love this picture because this is my office mate. And John Dorn, Christine Ambrosone, and uh, Pauline Mendola. Unfortunately, you're covered by me. Back then, we didn't have pictures in you know, the phone that we could say, oh, that's a bad one. Let's do it again. And that's my song. So my goal when I was working on the dissertation is like, I have to finish before he starts walking. And I didn't totally make it because he was running in Farber Hall after the defense. So, so anyway, great memories. So... Um, after my dissertation, I published the papers. And this is, I was, back then, I was not so much into the impact factor. We probably could have gone for much higher impact factor that cancer causes and control because this was one of the first, I mean, there was maybe another one, but one of the first papers that look at diet and alcohol in a cohort setting and, and lung cancer. And it has been referenced many times. We have made the, um, contributed to the, diet, uh, the guidelines. So it's an important paper. And this is the other one that I published for my dissertation with Dr. Graham. But I'm showing this because back then we didn't have track changes. So the, basically I was sent to co-authors the paper, hard copy, and then they will send me back the paper. I was, the second one, I was already in New Jersey. So they sent me the comments, the edits, always very good. But the program went beyond that. And he sent me this letter, personalized letter. It's maybe hard to read, so I just typed it, typed it so that you can. Uh, it was lovely to hear from you and to know that, that one, you're bringing this work to the Aborigines of New Jersey, <laughs> and two, that you have acquired two kids. I think that is wonderful. Aren't they, aren't they fun? I don't think that you should have had the girl first. They are naturally more civilized and she could have helped you with the boy. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway, anyway, congratulations on your family and the way you're developing your career with one regard, Saxon. And then the an asterisk over. And then he asked the question, is it because they had two X chromosomes? <laughs> so it was so great. So I get this letter all the time. And when I got the invitation, it's like, I have to find this letter. So anyway, after that, I moved to Rutgers. I'm at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And I've been going through the whole ranks. I met with great students today. And I hopefully my advice was helpful. Just be persistent and, and continue. And now I have several administrative positions. Pauline mentioned my research interests in several areas that I'm working on, but I thought because of the legacy of Dr. Graham, it would be better to talk about the contribution to guide the public health and contribution to dietary guidelines. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the evolution of the guidelines, the a little bit of the pur purpose, but mostly the process, the behind the scenes uh, that I, because I've been there, I can uh, explain a little bit of how it goes and some of the challenges, but also comparing with other guidelines. 
So I've been involved, as I mentioned, both with the American Cancer Society and, and the World Cancer Research Fund, American Institute for Cancer Research. So for the Ameri and what I'm highlighting in yellow is the ones that are in which I was involved, and the other ones is what I know. So the American Cancer Society, the first guidelines was in 1984, is the first time. And back then, it was mostly case control studies, what we knew, and, and a few, it was really almost the beginning. And so from time to time, they uh, update the guidelines uh, the, for survivors started in 2001. We don't know as much for survivors that we know for cancer prevention. And again, so I was involved since 2006. And then I will also talk a little bit about my experience with the guidelines for AICR, WCRF. And I was involved in 2007 and 2018. So in 1984, you can see, I'm going to be showing more or less the major um, factors that were in the guidelines. So number one, you start with obesity in, 19, in 1984, which was kind of surprising for me. That was the first one. But notice the focus on foods and nutrients, fiber, fat, vitamin C. Um, that was the time with the carotenoids, was beta carotene was very important and all of that. Then we go, this is... Again, I'm a graduate student here, and there was a lot of discussion about dietary fat and cancer because the experimental animal studies have shown an association, and the ecological studies, you can see that there's a big correlation between per capita fat availability and breast cancer incidence. So there was like, why we cannot find, why cannot we replicate it? So actually for case control studies also, this is a combined pool analysis of nine case control studies. Also you see an association. Higher fat intake is associated with higher risk of uh, breast cancer. So we go to 91 and it's still fat is there, fiber. So a little less focus on nutrients, but they're still there. Then Dr. Ramp's paper comes out. This is the New York State cohort. and no association with fat. There was nothing there. So again, a lot of discussions in both in my training, but also in the literature in general, why we cannot replicate the studies in humans. Um, so now you see 96, we still have fat there, processed, feed, uh, processed meat, fruits and vegetables. Then the more time elapsed, now we have a lot of uh, cohort studies and we can pull data from cohort studies. So the New York State cohort was included in the pooling project. You see Saxon there, Jim Marshall, also co-author. The pooling project find no association whatsoever with fat. There was nothing there. So what happened then, uh, Tim Byers led the guidelines for 2002, and you see that now we are talking about a healthy diet pattern. Fat and the specific nutrients is no longer there. So 2006, I was involved in this one, and uh, the way it was done, the committee members were invited, and I was invited, this is a little backtrack, but basically I, I was involved already with WCRF and AICR, and that's why the ACS invited me to participate on this, and we got assigned, I believe Joe was involved in this one, we got all assigned to specific topics, so for me it was usually I get endometrial ovarian, alcohol, obesity, those usually are the ones. So individual members got assignments and we were, each expert were considered experts. So each one could pick the papers that we thought were key papers for that particular narrative review. Um, and then of course we, we all picked the high quality studies where we thought, and then we gave these uh, summaries to for the different topics that were assigned to us to the committee and the, we all look at the whole thing and decided, okay, do we need to change the, the guidelines the way we had it before? And this is the, the uh, guidelines for 2006. And now you can see that the main change is that uh, maintain a healthy body weight is number one now. So it went up, then physical activity and a healthy diet pan pattern. And you can see alcohol across all the years have always been limit alcohol consumption. Then 2012 came, very similar, only that now we tried and I helped them with the methods, try to make it more systematic. It's not going to be a, a systematic literature review on all the topics because as it's, it's a major process, but at least we were more specific about using randomized clinical trials, meta-analysis, and high um, quality individual studies. So key cohort studies, less focus on case control. 
and then the same process after that. So uh, um, we published the paper in 2012, and as you can see, the only difference that you can see in the 2012 is now we use the word achieve and maintain, not just maintain, but for people that are overweight or obese, uh, uh, achieve uh, a healthy body weight. And then the 2020 guidelines, which are the current guidelines, if you're interested in this, uh, committee members with, uh, again, varied expertise. So the process is the same. You, you get assigned certain topics. The big difference is that the searches for the 20 uh, guidelines of the guidelines for survivors since 2022 <clears throat> published. Now the ACS staff did the, all the um, searches. So basically the reviewers were given, or oh, the reviewers, I should say, the, the experts in the committee were giving the papers that you're supposed to summarize. So we couldn't say, oh, but there's this new cohort that has been published that is very important for this particular topic. We have to just summarize what we're given to us. So that's the big difference. So it was supposed to be more systematic. I don't know if it's better or worse. I won't get into that, but that's the big difference for the 2020 and 2022 for survivors. And then uh, this is the paper that you can find it if you're interested in the topic. And at the end of the day, similar, achieve and maintain a healthy body weight, physical activity, a healthy diet pattern, and alcohol. So I'm going to talk next about WCRF. Very different process, much more comprehensive, cost much more too. So there are three reports, the 97 to 2007, then the CAP with continuous update project was launched. And then finally, the 2018 um, uh, report was released. So 1997, uh, that's a lot of text. You don't have to look at it. I'm just presenting so that you see there, there were 14 recommendations, um, a population goal and an individual goal. This was considered at that time like the Bible for anybody that is was interested in nutrition and cancer. It's like so comprehensive, very well done. Um, again, many people involved in that. And then, so I had it, I, had it, I still have it in my office, underlying and everything. So then in, after that, they invite, I had the opportunity because I just received um, a grant looking at endometrial phytoestrogen and alcohol and endometrial cancer. And the WCRF wanted to do a pilot to see, to assess the feasibility of the methodology for the report. So I was lucky that I was invited to be uh, part of this. And Joe was also, we invited her. So I thought this was, it was such a great exercise that I thought that people may, may find it interesting. So the question is, two people, two groups doing a systematic literature review in two parts of the world, will they come to with the same results? Um, so that was a very interesting uh, exercise. This is that we didn't know who the other group was, by the way, and we were supposed to get every possible paper published in nutrition, physical activity, diet, physical activity, and endometrial cancer. Um, so I'm presenting here who they were, but we didn't know who they were. And so we invited people, we collect, uh, Larry Cushy and I uh, collect the, the SLR, and we invited Joe, we invited Margie from the American Cancer Society, Kanuja was at NCI, to, so to have representation from different, so that we all have access to the best. And we were supposed to search all the different databases in the world, and the, basically the assessment, the reproducibility assessment was the search results will be the same, the study design allocation, key papers, and the meta-analysis results. And it was surprising. So we found 300, overall, 310 papers, but only 54% were included in both centers. So that was surprising that you would think it's the same databases, right? Um, and then the agreement for inclusion of key paper was only 87%, which was also interesting. And uh, the, uh, of the, <laughs> this was even more interesting because we were all experienced epidemiologists and only 80% were allocated the same study design, which is like <laughs> very interesting. But most of them was the discrepancy in the cohort study design, and because the earlier papers, the quality was many times was poor. So we like, we're reading and we couldn't figure out what they wanted. Now the journals have all these guidelines that you, you're supposed to present so much detail. So that was very kind of funny and interesting. But the important thing is that the meta-analysis at the end 
all that discrepancy it was noise, essentially, because you can see that at the end of the day, you're basically getting the same results. And as a consequence of this feasibility, um, they kind of modified the methodology to use for the, the final um, systematic literature review and meta-analysis, uh, and they exclude the case series because it's just noise. It didn't do anything. So then um, it was launched. Uh, nine uh, centers across the world led the systematic literature reviews, and um, Larry Cushy and I led one, the endometrial cancer one. And there were like so many people involved, methodology task force, mechanism task force, these uh, systematic literature review centers, peer reviewers, an international expert panel, and panel observers, so a major undertaking. And the guidelines, I will go, I won't go into that much just to show you body fatness, the, the first one on physical activity, then foods and drinks that promote weight gain, plant foods, animal foods. So not much, not so much nutrient um, specific, uh, but it's also more general. And then the big difference between American Cancer Society and WCRF is that this is supposed to be global. So some of the preservation processing and preparation is also for other countries that use a lot of salting. And so that, that's the other thing uh, to consider. It's a little bit different in that way. So after the 2007 was launched, the a continuous update project was launched. And I was, at that point, I was invited to be in the expert panel. Um, and it's, it's been an amazing experience too. So no more uh, case control. Now it's only cohort studies. So we're really looking at the best. So a systematic literature review, which are not many in nutrition and cancer, and the meta-analysis of cohort studies. And this is the continuous update process, basically. Now the big difference are all the systematic literature reviews, instead of being done at individual centers, they're all centralized at Imperial College. So there was a, a team there that will do all the meta-analysis and everything before the systematic literature review, there was a protocol that was peer reviewed. And then the, the uh, systematic literature review is peer reviewed. And that was fed to the expert panel. And it, it, for every, I have another one. This is the expert panel, um, many faces that you probably can recognize here. And so the, they will feed these systematic literature reviews for breast cancer, it was probably 400 pages. And each, for each meeting, we, we went, this is the, in London, the, the headquarters of the World Cancer Research Fund. And for each meeting, there will be two of the expert panels were assigned to review carefully the, um, the report, the systematic literature review, and kind of putting it into this matrix. So we had to say, okay, all these meta-analyses, does it fit into convincing, probable, limited suggested, limited no conclusion, or substantial effects is unlikely. And it's based on the, as you recognize, basically the AB here criteria. So it's like consistency, the strength of the association, is the heterogeneity, um, for the most part, we agree in most of the exposures, it was clear cut. Other times there was a lot of discussion in the panel. Is there bias? Can you exclude bias? Um, and that kind of thing. So it was, a, from the point of view of learning for me, it was amazing to be in that room and you know, discuss all these things and, and possibilities. Um, this are our tasks. This is one of the meetings in London uh, where we're looking at meta-analysis. Um, we will spend two or three days, so it was very thorough. It's not like just looking at and then um, so dedicated a lot of time to come up to, with these matrices. So anybody that have looked at nutrition and cancer, I'm sure that you have used this. Um, so it's for each of the exposures, we had to put them into one of these categories. And then after, so we met many times for the different cancer sites. And then at the end of the, before the luncheon, we, we got uh, together and decided, okay, that's the matrix where you're summarizing all the cancer sites and all the exposures. And if it's uh, dark green, it's convincing. If it's light green, it's probable. And the opposite for, for uh, red is increased risk, uh, how strong is increased risk. So based on that, we were able to now discuss what are the recommendations overall. So again, taking into account that this is public health recommendations, so it has to be 
for everybody. So you may have findings sometimes that is in, in one direction for one cancer and in another direction for us, other cancer. Then that, that we don't include it in the recommendations. Uh, so that type of thing. So in 2018, it was lunch, and I was invited to do this National Press Club uh, release. It's one of the things that you're in your training, you're never used to do this thing. It was, okay, a little bit outside of my scope and training, but doing this, it was interesting. Um, and selected people were invited in the audience. And after that, I also helped them disseminate. And I went to Mexico and did it in Spanish to disseminate the guidelines and in several nutrition and meetings, et cetera. Uh, because it's like we do epidemiology, we have to do the policy part and then the dissemination is a lot of what we need to do. It doesn't stop with the research. You have to continue with that. So the major difference uh, of what we've been seeing uh, with the nutrient-specific now we're talking about an overall package. That's the major, the evolution is that now they're talking about a healthy lifestyle that includes all these elements, but you cannot focus. It's not um, a single thing that you can do to prevent cancer. You really have to focus on a healthy lifestyle. And just to show you a little bit for, for each one, uh, obesity is such an important factor, as all of you know, and you can see here it's convincing for many cancers and probably for many other cancers. Um, I'm not going to saturate the presentation with a forest plus, but just to show you an example of how it looked like, the things that the expert panel was looking. Uh, so um, we will present, for example, this is uh, a meta-analysis of the forestophageal adenocarcinoma and BMI. And most of the time we were presented by five units of BMI. So this is the continuous analysis and you can see that it's very, very uh, consistent. This is for color reta. This is uh, another way of, of presenting. We will have forest plus, we will have these dose response associations. And you can see again, very a strong association uh, with uh, this is color reta cancer and endometrial cancer is the strongest association that you can find for obesity. So very clear. Uh, weight circumference, uh, also very strong and at all weight gain. Uh, this is the recommendation, be a healthy weight and keep your weight within the healthy range and avoid weight gain in adult life. Um, I want to show you that sometimes people say, oh, the, the guidelines are so confusing. And I just want to show you that it's a lot of consistency across all the different chronic diseases. So this is the for cardiovascular disease. Uh, weight loss is a major um, um, recommendation and counseling and comprehensive lifestyle interventions. They should be carefully implemented and individualized, especially in older adults. Calculating BMI is recommended, and I'm highlighting that because I'm sure that you have heard that BMI is not a good tool and it's controversial. People talk, it's like, oh, we should just discard BMI. So I'm happy to talk more about it during the Q&A if you want, because I don't agree with that necessarily. And it is reasonable to measure weight circumference, which is another easy way to do it. And uh, it measure it's a very good process for BXR fat as well as the cardiometabolic risk. For diabetes, of course, uh, and not only uh, managing glycemic uh, load, glucose, but also uh, weight is a major uh, recommendation. And physical activity, a major factor too. They kind of go together. And the recommendation is be physically active as part of everyday life and walk more and sit less. And in general, you will see the recommendations for WCRF that is follow national guidelines because this is, again, it's a global uh, uh, thing. So for the guidelines for us, it's 2018. This is the physical activity guidelines advisory report and is uh, move more and sit less. Then the recommendation is at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes to 150 minutes uh, uh, a week of vigorous activity or a combination of the two. And if you do more, it's better. If you can do more than 300, even better. And muscle strengthening activity is recommended uh, at least two or more days a week. That was not in the cancer prevention recommendation, and it's because we don't have 
the recommendations are all evidence-based. So if there are no studies that have looked at, the, at this specifically, a uh, randomized clinical trial or a cohort study, then we cannot include it, but that's why. But we know that there are lots of benefits, particularly for survivors. Um, for cancer prevention, this is, again, the guidelines at the national level. Is exactly, you can see that ACS follow exactly the recommendation uh, that we just saw, uh, limit sedentary behavior. And for cancer survivors, in general, the recommendation for cancer survivors, I'm not going to be talking a lot about it, but I'm happy to discuss if anybody has questions, um, is very similar. So it's follow the recommendation for cancer prevention, if you can, but also, Every cancer is different, every situation is different. So follow the guidelines of your uh, physician, your oncologist, because it depends, it has to be tailored to you, uh, particularly for people in active treatment. Um, this is the for the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. Very similar here is 150, to, so they don't put the 300 um, activity, but again, it's uh, very um, highly recommended and decreases sedentary behavior. So we go to dietary patterns. This is the healthy dietary pattern that I've been talking about. Eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit, and beans. Limit consumption of fast foods. And, and this is mostly an ultra-processed food. And this is mostly because of the impact in healthy weight. So it's going to affect obesity, and that is going to affect uh, cancer. Uh, consumption of red and processed meat, and that was, should be limited limit consumption of sweetened drinks. And again, that's because of the obesity connection. Um, I won't go a lot into that. Um, and the, I wanted to show this so, so that this is fiber and um, postmenopausal breast cancer. How Dr. Graham again has been influential in the dietary guidelines. This is from the last report and his uh, study is still making it into the forest plus. So again, major contribution to the guidelines. Uh, for the cardiovascular, for yeah, cardiovascular disease, very similar as you can see, vegetable, fruit, legumes, nuts, whole grains are very good sources of protein. Uh, saturated fat, we don't talk so much about fat for the prevention guidelines, except that when you have ultra processed food, you're going to have high saturated fat. But for heart disease, they recommend replacing saturated fat with monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat and reduce cholesterol and sodium. And um, also limit the consumption of processed meat, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened, which we heard also. And trans fat should be avoided. These are the new dietary guidelines for Americans, very similar, as you can see. Um, the difference I'm going to show a table. Oh, what I wanted to point out here to the dietary guidelines mentioned the culture of basically. It's a healthy dietary pattern, but you can adjust it to your culture. So, so it has many different ways that you can eat a healthy diet, whether you know it's Mediterranean diet or it's an Indian diet. There's many ways that you can do it. So I like that. And this is to show again, because many times people tell me it's confusing, the guidelines are confusing how it is really not that confusing. You can see that for the most part, the good things are consistently there and the bad things in red, you can see that most agencies uh, are saying limit or avoid. Um, I just want to talk about dairy to point out that you can see that it is in the uh, American Diabetes Association and, and also the guidelines for America, but not for cancer prevention, and this is why. So di dairy in general for prostate cancer is detrimental. So it has been shown that can increase risk, even the evidence here is limited, but it's still there's lots of literature that perhaps is not a good thing. But for colorectal cancer, there's uh, data showing that it, it reduces risk. And just to show you here the a little bit of the forest plots of the curves for, for dairy and colorectal cancer, you can see that it's quite consistent that it, it prevents, uh, it reduces risk. Uh, and the dose response also indicates that. While for prostate, you can see that increases risk, at, at least for some elements, like low-fat milk is 6% increased risk per 200 grams per day, and the same for cheese um, uh, also increases risk. So, um, And these are all well-conducted studies. So that's why I didn't make it into the guidelines, because you want that something that is appropriate for everybody, for all cancers. Um, alcohol is a very interesting topic. Um, 
So it is highly used, particularly for college students. Um, it represents the third largest contributor of cancer in women after smoking and obesity, so a major risk factor. But public awareness is still, even if we knew since 1984 that it's a carcinogen, people still don't know about alcohol and cancer, particularly young people, which is surprising. Um, and we know that there are multiple deleterious consequences. This is the, we have known this for a long time. There's nothing new, how convincing it is that uh, alcohol increases risk for many cancers. And this figure is new to some people that actually for breast cancer, even very small amount, it's a linear relationship. So even for very small amounts, you can see an increased risk. And this is uh, the, from the pooling project uh, with 20 cohorts. So this is what, um, prompted that now we say for alcohol, there's nothing that is safe. For, for cancer, there's nothing that is safe. Even a small amount can in increase risk. So the recommendation is for cancer prevention is better not to drink alcohol. And that has been in the previous guidelines. It was like, if you drink, drink in moderation, because it was this thing that if you drink um, one drink per day, you know, in moderation, that could benefit cardiovascular disease. Now, even that is controversial, but particularly for cancer is not a good thing. And there are other ways that you can to reduce cardiovascular disease. There are other ways and in, instead of uh, starting to drink alcohol. This is for the ACS and the same thing is best not to drink alcohol. And this is new from the current guidelines. Before, as I said, it's like, if you drink, drink in moderation, but now it's like, for cancer, it's best not to drink. Um, and then for survivors, it's follow the general recommendation. So in 2018, I don't know if you have seen that, but people are interested in alcohol. This is a very good report published for the first time. The American Society of Clinical Oncology issued a statement about alcohol and cancer. And it basically just prompted the importance of the topic that there's no knowledge. That is something that oncologists in the oncology setting is never discussed with the patient. Um, a part of it is that what the paper said is that in the oncology setting, the oncologists sometimes feel uncomfortable discussing the topic because um, they themselves drink. So it's a kind of a controversial thing. Um, and then another thing that came up is the, the particular need to better understanding during the impact of alcohol during the survivorship period. Uh, and it provides very good public health strategies and, and everything and recommends eliminating pinkwashing. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but this still happens. Every October is a, cancer, a breast cancer awareness month and you see in bars, uh, they have pink drinks for, uh, you know, consuming pink drinks you know, it increases awareness of breast cancer, which I, I never understood, but, but it still happens. I don't know uh, what this is about, but... Uh, and then in, this was during COVID, uh, the NCI uh, put together a, a group of experts to discuss alcohol and, and cancer. What are the, what do we know and what, do, what we don't know, particularly not just epidemiology, but they were basic scientists and, and as well as epidemiologists and communication experts. And so what are the communication strategies that we need to increase awareness? Um, uh, that's a, and, policy to, to uh, so anyway, the, this paper, if you're interested, um, it's a nice summary as well as um, what are the research gaps. And that was to inform the NCI for RFAs that they will issue, what are the specific topics that, and one of them is also uh, alcohol patterns across the life course. And that's not just for alcohol, for a lot of these um, exposures, nutrition exposure, we really don't know much about the life course. Um, and the American Heart Association, which is the one that everybody always oh, drinking is good for, for the heart. Uh, even then, is you drink, drink in moderation. And that means, oh, I should say for alcohol in moderation is for women is no more than one drink per day. And for men is no more than two drinks per day. So, and that's standard for all the guidelines say the same thing. Um, so yeah, the, the American, and then for diabetes, Again, they're very cautious, the available evidence does not support recommending alcohol consumption. And people should, that if you don't drink, don't start drinking for any beneficial effects for, for health. 
uh, the guidelines are kind of the same. Adults of legal drinking age can choose not to drink or to drink in moderation by limiting intake. And drinking less is better for health than drinking more. And one thing to consider too, that alcohol drinking is not just the alcohol, but the calories when you consume these cocktails with alcohol and they have a lot of syrup and some of them could be 400 calories and you consume two or three in a night out and you're like, okay, then you have 1,200 calories right there that you don't even notice that you have consumed anything. So it's a problem for the obesity epidemic too. For supplements, I'm not going to say much, but basically do not use supplements for cancer. There's no benefits. Uh, supplements are beneficial for people that have deficiencies, but there's no evidence that it, it will help with cancer. Uh, I'm not talking about it, but notice that WCRF has also breastfeeding as one of the recommendations. Um, so that's for the... And then... For survivorship, again, I'm not going to say a lot because it was, I'm not, I don't know how I'm with the time, but um, there's lots that we can discuss if you're interested. It's a kind of similar. The data is not as comprehensive as we have for, for prevention because it's a new field, but it's, you have to pause when you're giving the recommendations because it's so different depending on the type of cancer, the time of active treatment versus after treatment. So it's a little different, but we also have guidelines for that. Uh, so in summary, uh, nutrition guidelines uh, have evolved, as I mentioned today. So we went from a very nutrient focus on, on food and you know specific foods to a more holistic approach. So um, yeah, we want a, a healthy lifestyle pattern. And overall are very compatible all the guidelines that you can see. So if you follow a healthy lifestyle, you're going to prevent cancer, but also chronic diseases. So a health, uh, public health practitioners, you can also um, say that, that it's like, yeah, it's not just cancer, you're, you're going to benefit. And that's the same thing for survivors, that we have to worry not only about survival, but they, many of them have comorbidities. So following these guidelines is going to help to manage their own comorbidities. Um, and obesity is a major risk factor, as I have shown, for cancer risk, diagnosis, treatment, treatment side effects, and survival. Maintaining a healthy uh, weight is an active lifestyle is crucial for cancer and chronic disease prevention. And there's not a magic diet, um, but a healthy dietary pattern that we should follow. And it's funny that somebody recently asked me, so what should I do for this person found out that I work in nutrition and cancer, what should I do? And I said, the holistic approach and whatever. And then he asked me, oh, so what pill should I take? And I'm like, okay, let's rewind. <laughs> so people still look for the magic bullet, but it's like, no, it's a healthy dietary pattern. It's like you have to change uh, towards a healthy life, really, including exercise. And there's no reason to drink alcohol. And if you do, do in moderation, try to avoid um, and uh, critical to increase awareness of the link. I have alcohol, but also uh, obesity. Many times when I give talks about obesity, people come to me, it's like, oh, I didn't know that obesity actually causes cancer. So it's like, it's something that general, the public doesn't know. And uh, nutritional needs should be met mostly from food sources. Um, in terms of research gaps after that. So we need better characterization of exposures most of the evidence that we know for um, for nutrition and diet uh, is all based for the most part in food frequency questionnaires, which is, we know, are imperfect. Um, uh, I don't know if we're going to have in the near future any better ways to measure diet because it's so difficult. But I, we, I have confidence. I've been also criticized about, oh, FFQs are terrible. You don't know anything. But I think that we can rank people according to... So the, the evidence here is going to continue uh, that a healthy diet because the FFQs can rank people at least in, in whether you eat well or you eat... No, who eat, doesn't like broccoli ever, or who eats more vegetables and less. So for that, it's useful. Um, we need more about uh, the impact of diet, body composition, alcohol, and physical activity through the life course. As I mentioned, there's a lot of evidence during adolescence. So hard to study too, because you have to base and recall. Not many studies have um, information prospectively that you can follow, but it's something that we still don't know, particularly for breast cancer. It's an important 
issue. Biological mechanisms, a lot of the mechanisms we know are postulated mechanisms that we, we find, but we need more information. Um, and association by cancer subtypes, this is something that now that the uh, cohort studies that we have are accruing more cases, we can do a certified analysis and look at for example, molecular subtypes of breast cancer, triple negative, where even now, even pulling data, sometimes we start running, you know, very small numbers because you have to stratify by menopausal status. And so I think that in the future, we're going to be able to, to know more when we are pulling studies and we have more cases. Uh, and the same thing for a histotype for ovarian cancer is another thing that very inconsistent evidence because the numbers get very small. Um, impact of, for cancer survivorship, that's an active area of research. Uh, more and more, um, there are very well designed studies. At the beginning, it was mostly follow up of case control studies and um, all the cases in case control studies, but now we have very well designed studies um, that will be able to address a lot of these things. And research in the, on diverse populations because of most of the evidence that I presented are based on studies conducted in white uh, populations. So uh, I think in the future, um, NIH is really requesting more diversity in the study. So we're going to be able to see whether these guidelines apply to all groups. And we don't know if that's the case. These are some resources that I have been presenting for anybody interested. I really recommend uh, these papers and and this is uh, came in, in the New York Times a while ago, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And this is more or less the short answers to the supposedly incredible, uh, complicated and confusing question of what we should eat to maintain a healthy, be healthy. And this was 2007, but I think it can apply today. Still, after all of this, basic is kind of basic and common sense. So try to avoid ultra processed foods and, and go to the traditions. So I think that's all I have. I hope I'm not too long or I'm doing okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're on. Um, so now we're open for questions, and I'll be on this side, Jen's going to be on that side, and we're going to ask people to use the microphone so the people on Zoom can hear us. Yeah. That was a really terrific presentation. Thank you so much. It's really, it, among other things, I was amazed at all the different ways we've collaborated past the time you were. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. great. Um, so just one comment and then one more of a question. So my comment is when I was in graduate school, the, um, so that's in the late eighties, the, um, the dietary guidelines for America did not even consider chronic disease. They were like, we can't, you know, it's similar to what Pauline was referring to in terms of the, um, the obstacles that Saxon ran into in doing his research, there was this idea you couldn't study chronic disease. Oh. And so the dietary guidelines were really of only about deficiencies, you know, oh, okay. nutrient deficiencies. And that the assumption was that was all we could study. So it's, you know, it's really exciting to see like this huge movement. And that's probably why the, the study started out looking more at nutrients than at, at patterns of, of intake. Anyway, so it's just interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, so when you think about gaps, and this kind of ties in with the idea about um, uh, life course and, and in terms of diet, um, I I think that there's a gap in that we don't really know about what happens if people change their diet. So no, if uh, they have a bad diet and they and they alter it to meet the guidelines or move towards the guidelines, um, uh, I mean, the assumption is that that works, but we don't have much data on that. And um, so, you know, you might talk a little bit about that. So what I know, I don't know if I should be here so that I'm seeing. Okay. So the, the, that's a great comment. We know that people that there are a lot of papers and they keep coming up, the paper showing that people that follow the guidelines, 
do better. For Greece can survive all this a lot of literature. We don't know about this change because that would require a randomized clinical trials, right? If you get yourself, but that would be very difficult to do. Uh, or p papers that have longitudinal uh, data and then look it up. Um, yeah, that's probably something that we could do in some of the cohorts that we have um, and look, yeah. Well, and it kind of fits in with the life course idea. Yeah. You know, so what well, happens if somebody is a crazy drinker when they're an adolescent and then they they switch to, you know, once they hit their 30s, they drink a more moderate, you know, there's just a lot to to yeah. do. And, you know, so the alcohol one's on my mind because yeah. we did, yeah. there was an IARC um, mm -hmm. review that's going to come out about that. But I think in all, for all of diet, you yeah. know, if somebody doesn't eat vegetables and they start to eat vegetables, yeah. how fast does it make a difference or does yeah. it make a difference? Yeah. And the limitation again is the existing data that we have that's very difficult to collect. So in the Women's Circle of Health study that I collaborated with Christine Ambrosone that you, well, many of you know, um, we collected information of, per, you know, starting in when you were in your teens, when you were in your 20s. And it was such a mess of data because people don't remember, people may not want to report it to drink, you know, illegal drinking. So it's very difficult. So you have the, either you go retrospectively or you collect prospectively. So I think for survivors, it may be easier to do because you take them a diagnosis and then you can follow up, it's easier. But the, the life course with adolescents and all of that is so hard. There are not many studies that have that. So the limitations of the guidelines is that it's based on the evidence that we have. But yeah, that's a terrific question. What happens if you change um, yeah, your, your habits? And alcohol, the whole alcohol for um, um, you know survival, how for breast cancer, it increases risk. But then alcohol after a cancer diagnosis is very inconsistent. And part of it is like, are women really reporting what they drink? You know, there's a lot of them reporting. That's the problem. It's a behavior that you may not want to say, or they really don't drink, or you have reverse causation because the people that drink are the ones that are feeling better. So it's, that's why I mean for survivorship, it's like, a whole new, that's why initially I wanted to talk about that too, because I'm very interested in survivorship, but it's like, that's a whole talk <laughs> to talk about the, the nutrition uh, and, you know, association with cancer survivorship and alcohol is so interesting too. Any other question? Okay. Uh, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I just have a question about um, the obesity risk piece. Um, are you aware of any data that can point whether, like what percentage of that is due to the adipocytes themselves versus, you know, delayed healthcare seeking? Um, and so individuals yeah. with obesity get delayed or get diagnosed at later stages, which increases their risk. So I, I haven't, I'm not aware of a paper that have divided the attributable risk for the different things, but there are papers that have shown, and that's why I'm so interested personally in obesity, because it affects everything. From the diagnosis, we know that people that are that people with obesity tend to be diagnosed later. And there are issues about the detection or sometimes it could be discrimination. With the healthcare, we know that obesity is something that I've also been very interested in, is the obese the capping of chemotherapy dosing for uh, women with obesity, that's an issue. So it's going to affect also um, uh, chemotherapy dosing and treatment in general. You have more side effects, uh, complications. Um, in terms of access to care, I don't know directly, but we know that underrepresented, under, under, underserved populations tend to have lower access to care and they also have to, tend to have more obesity. So it's not direct, but there's that connection. So, but we know that direct, there are direct effects of obesity in cancer risk and cancer prognosis. Uh, prognosis. We have that all these pathways that have been demonstrated of the cardiometabolic dysregulation, that and hormonal uh, and dysregulation that happen with obesity that is going to affect risk and survival. So, so I think that we have different pockets. I don't know if anybody have looked at okay, how much is due to this, how much is due to that. But. Okay, thank you. So it's likely additive risk from all of these things together. Thank you. Yep. I have a question from Nancy Crenshaw, who's joining us via Zoom. Nancy says, excellent talk. 
I tend to agree that BMI is still a good measure, despite the unpopularity of it. Can you speak to why you still support it? Why is it super BMI? So yeah, I, I think it's really misinformation. And I have heard in meetings, actually, professional meetings, when people say it's useless, uh, it's a, a lot of misclassification, but there are two reasons why I still believe in it. First of all, it's practical. From a public health point of view, weight and height, anybody can do it. We can all right now figure out are you overweight and whatever. Overweight women, overweight People, I'm sorry, I keep saying women because my research is always in women. So I, I like them to think of women. But uh, in, during overweight, you're going to have more misclassification. But the women, that are, the people that have BMI greater than 30 or 35, there's really no misclassification there. They have excess adiposity. So I think it's a very good screening tool for practitioners and to follow up. Like we saw the, the American Heart Association is uh, um, recommending it that people are followed with that. And I remember there was an editorial or something. Oh yeah, there was a paper talking about body composition and survival and how BMI shouldn't be used. And the journal asked me to write an editorial. So I wrote my views, <laughs> what I think. And then a practitioner wrote to me, what should I do? I don't have a CT scan in my office, what should I do? And that's what I mean, that's misinformation because it is a very practical tool for people that don't have the resources to have, we're not going to have CT scans every year for people just to see they are obese. Uh, so so I, I still think, and also if you look at the literature, I don't have it in this presentation, but I have presented this in the past. There's graphs that you can see after BMI of 30 or 35, all the risk increases for diabetes, uh, hypertension, um, cardiovascular disease, cancer. So it's still useful, at least for the screening. You just have to be careful. If you're overweight, it could be lean mass that is heavier, and then th there's going to be some misclassification there. So don't overreact with your patient or you're giving advice. It's okay, you're overweight, you know, and there are a lot of scales now that touch your body composition, so you can measure your adiposity and your lean mass. But yeah, so that's why I still think that it is a useful tool. I don't think that we need to discuss. We know the limitations, but yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And waist circumference. I have to say something about waist circumference. In our own research, we found waist circumference was a great uh, marker of increased risk in survivors. And this was black women with breast cancer, uh, much more than BMI. And it's a measure, as I uh, mentioned before, about uh, central obesity. So people that have greater uh, waist circumference is even better than waist to hip ratio. They're going to have, um, and are more likely to have metabolic syndrome, and that's going to increase risk of cardiovascular disease and many other. So, so yeah, I think waist circumference is, and that's what I recommend to clinicians when they cannot do it. It's like just measure participants. That would be. Yeah. Any other question? There's another one there. Yeah. Oh, that was your question. Okay, one more over here, Anja. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banderas. Excellent presentation. Uh, I'm Ajay Mainani. Uh, I'm a beneficiary. Uh, thank you again for, so I'm a direct beneficiary of your work on AACR, WCRF report. Uh, my dissertation was on dietary patterns and lung cancer in the women's health. Can you speak closer to the microphone? Oh, is that sorry. okay? Thank you. Uh, my dissertation research was on dietary patterns and lung cancer in the women's health initiative. Oh. Okay. Um, I didn't find an association. I uh, couldn't uh, get over smoking. Very well done in the Women's Health Initiative with uh, capturing the exposure, but uh, our diet quality that I measured didn't overcome the smoking uh, confounding. Um, so I, I moved on to, so I, I was, I, my PhD was in epidemiology. I am currently working uh, with Dr. Katia Noyes, uh, you might have met her today. Uh, we work. I'm working more on healthcare research now, more yeah. translational research. So, uh, working on obesity and cancer, and also in different populations, uh, especially minority populations. Um, so, I, I this is a probably asking you for advice on what to answer when some people ask me, like, um, and then your conclusion. Uh, so I also had a paper on raw garlic consumption and looking at lung cancer, had an excellent um, uh, response to that. Um, but 
again, the conclusion that we come up with, eat well and prevent disease. Um, if I, sorry, <laughs> if I tell that to my, you know, coming back to my family, my grandma, like, you know, or like, uh, what new are you telling me? I mean, didn't I give you good food? <laughs> you know, it's not, it's like, what are the new, what is the new thing that you're telling me? Um, and to answer myself, I feel like, you know, it's difficult to um, make my daughter eat better, uh, more foods, more vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, we are constantly awarding them or rewarding them with candy as a reward, mm -hmm. not a mm -hmm. fruit. So our, with your research, with so many years of your research, do you feel that there is a, as you said, somebody asked you for a pill? Are we making a change in the general perception, or is it, you know, as we're going forward, is there going to be more on treatment research? You know, if if there is a breakthrough in genetic um, uh, treatment or whatever it is that I mean, research is going there, like our funds are going there, so. That's what the question somebody asked me is that like, you know, what new are you telling me? You, are you telling me anything new? You did this great research, nutritional research has so many complicated statistical things. What new are you telling me? <laughs> and right now the research that we are doing is like obesity and we're looking at CR Medicare data, uh, obesity and cancer. We are presenting, uh, we're actually preparing our manuscript. We are presenting on the other side of it, um, in terms of ER uh, utilization, you know, uh, healthcare utilization, um, does your research, the research I did, is that gonna help or uh, open the eyes of policymakers, or is the other kind of research that we're doing on healthcare research? You know, you are spending this much money because the, of obesity. Is that gonna help policymakers? I, I just don't know the answer. I'm just asking you for advice. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure about what the question is. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's new? You're asking me what? Yeah, I'm sorry. How, how would you answer it? If I ask you, what new are you telling me? That your own parents or grandparents maybe didn't know? Or are we presenting uh, this research, like how do we get this research to the new generation who have probably even lesser um, interest or maybe even, you know. In diet and cancer and yes. obesity? In, well, well, in diet, basically. I, I think there should be a lot of interest uh, because at a minimum, even if we don't know, okay, fat or whatever, ultra product, there's still data that is coming up. Okay, the first thing, diet, I became interested in diet because it's a choice that you have to make every day. Every day you go to the supermarket, if you have kids, I started to study puberty because I had a girl that was going through the, through the puberty period and I wanted, do I buy organic or not? It's something that we have to, every day, we have to uh, come up with. The evidence, it's difficult to study diet. And what happened is that initially it was a lot of fruits and vegetables because we were taste control data that maybe there was recall bias. That is not there anymore so strong, but clearly, and there's a, in the WCRF report, there's a whole chapter dedicated to a healthy dietary pattern is um, benefits or um, prevents obesity. So at a minimum, it's going to help you maintain a healthy weight, and that's going to help you with cancer. There's individual dietary factors that we know have antioxidant properties that are going to help you um, with the, not only to prevent cancer, but if you get cancer, you're in better shape. Uh, and the same thing for cancer survivors. If they eat a healthy diet, they're going to be so much better off to you know, fight the disease, to, to have less. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that diet shouldn't be recommended. A healthy diet is absolutely, to me, is one of the most important things that you can do, including uh, exercise. So keep moving. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a slightly different, sorry, <laughs> I have a question that might take us in a slightly different direction. Uh, so, why is it? Oh, okay. Uh huh. Okay. So, as I was listening to 
the uh, to your description of the review process for mm -hmm. the guidelines, I was really impressed by the sheer number of literature articles that you had to review and sort of sift through, uh, decide what's quality, what isn't, what uh, becomes included and what doesn't. And so philosophically, <laughs> uh, as, a, as a research producer, as well as a consumer of research right. that others have produced, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the trends in publication where there's sort of a lot of uh, focus on innovation and, and wanting to have uh, sort of wanting to publish novel findings and not so novel findings take a longer time to publish. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your impressions on what is the balance between replication and sort of producing, publishing findings that others have already published and, and sort of obviously add to your plot uh, versus novelty where that seems where, you know, a lot of journals want to be yeah. and, and where a lot of uh, researchers are kind of um, either are going in that direction because they have something novel or they're struggling to publish because they don't. So, yeah, I'm switching direction on this conversation, yeah. but I wonder if you could no, talk it's about a very that good a little question. bit. And it's a complicated answer, too, because it depends. That's going to be my my answer. For replication, absolutely, we need it because some of the things in the matrices that you saw made it too probable because we didn't have enough studies that have looked at it. Replication is needed for sure. Uh, now, when you're publishing, that's a separate story. You have to say, why is it new? Otherwise, the introduction has to say, what is novel about your... They're not going to be novel in this replication. So so it's both absolutely you need to, um, to, to replicate these findings, and it contributes to the guidelines in the future. And particularly what I mentioned, we still need to pull papers together where, for example, I work on breast cancer. As I mentioned earlier, when you start looking, you start with 2,000 cases, and then it's like, okay, but now you have the subtypes and the premenopausal, postmenopausal, and then you have to stratify by HRT use. And so it's like it becomes so small, the numbers. So it's very important that we keep publishing, but then is the issue of getting funding and publishing. So as long as you're creative, and say in the introduction what's new, it should be okay. Uh, yeah. There's a question there. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I just had a question about something you mentioned at the end, which I found really interesting, and I just kind of wanted your expert opinion, I guess, on that. So you presented on the guidelines and how in more recent years they've been more focused on the overall pattern, dietary pattern versus individual nutrients. But then you also mentioned at the end about food frequency questionnaires and some of the limitations and how um, one way that you can kind of trust the food frequency question a little more is by looking at pattern versus okay. individual. Right. So I guess in your opinion, do you think that um, some of these recommendations are kind of based off of how you can adequately look at food fre food frequency questionnaires and maybe nutrients are are important. It's just that we don't have a sensitive enough tool to investigate that. So to answer to that, uh, the first thing is like, yeah, you're correct. The FFQ has very limitations, particularly the misrepresentation. And that's why I kind of skipping because others may disagree with me, but I don't think that with FFQ, you can really quantify it consume 200 grams for whatever, because we know that this is not the purpose of the FFQs. So that, with that in mind, um, I don't think that we should focus on nutrients either because we don't eat a nutrient, we eat foods and we eat patterns. So at the end of the day, that's not going to help you. What, you're going to eat more carotene? It's like, well, that goes with other things that, uh, or you eat more of this, you're, you're going to eat less of that. So I don't think the focus should be in nutrients. I think this is the right way to go. And also it simplifies for the public uh, the message. That's one thing. And the second thing is that that's another thing in the recommendations in the panel that we took into account and phrased it very carefully because if you say dietary fiber is good, we know that dietary fiber 
higher fiber is good for colorectal cancer. You cannot even say it that way because then people start buying supplements. So it's like they want that magic pill. And it's, it's, I don't want to say misinformation, but it's the interpretation of the public. You have to be very careful how you phrase things. So yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, it's really, you have to look at the holistic thing. Mm -hmm. Another. <laughs> Another question from our... Uh online folks. This is from Esther Farley. Esther says, what do you see as better characterization of diet coming up in this research field? I am working on bringing the plant-based dietary indices, PDI, to the WHI, looking at female cancer outcomes. Are you familiar with this newer analysis and do you find it useful? The, the, say the first part again. Uh... What do you see as better characteriz characterization of diet coming oh. up in this research field? In, uh, in terms of dietary patterns, what's better? Is that what the question is? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so plant-based diet, that's a, yeah, so they, there's a lot of dietary patterns and they have many common, commonalities like the uh, Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and at the end of the day, they're all very similar and it tends to be at the same way, at the same time, uh, very similar to the guidelines that we showed. There's a ACS uh, guidelines, the dietary pattern, the WCRF also has a way of um, capturing the adherence to and the healthy eating index. I don't have a preference from one or another. And what we have done in papers is that we compare, you use two or three, and then you compare what, what predicts the outcome better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question, Esther? <laughs> yes. Yes, <Thank> okay. <laughs> Hi, Elisa. Very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. I really liked the summary from about when I was involved in research in the early 80s. See how different things kind of came to the surface on yeah. what's interesting, how they came up, how they came down, how different disciplines. I thought that was great to have different people weigh in on it and come up with different answers. Yeah. So now it's, um, you know, eat good food, <laughs> not too much. And, yeah. you know, I mean, that, that kind of thing still hangs in there. And I think that's something we can uh, hang on to what, what yeah. to eat. Yeah. My question is, what about did un uh, artificial sweeteners come up in the discussions? Because it's, it's a bigger part than I think people realize sometimes. Yeah, and particularly coffee. There's a lot of interest in coffee. And I always mention, well, coffee is very healthy, actually. Uh, I'm sorry for the tangent, but when you mention this, it makes me think of coffee. It's healthy, but the problem is what you put in coffee, that the frappuccinos and the syrup and all of that. So for artificial sweetener, there was back in the maybe 90s, the artificial sweeteners and bladder cancer. So now what... Um, there's really not that recommendations right now is that for cancer, if you consume artificial sweeteners at a normal level, you know, not like, <laughs> then it, it's fine. It's not, there's no increased risk for cancer. So it's fine if you, with your coffee, just use artificial sweeteners, but don't overdose. For most things, the dose make the poison. That's what they say, right? So, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really informative. Um, as someone who knows very little about diet, except for I eat every day, um, <laughs> I was curious about um, any movement towards looking at people that are going to be using the new class of obesity drugs and how uh, diet quality might impact outcomes there, because presumably they could still eat terribly, but you know, maybe less or or. Yeah. Uh, I have anecdotal evidence I have from my family, two people in my family are on Ozempic and one eats just as awfully as before, but has lost yeah. a lot of weight. The other one eats better, but and yeah. has also lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. uh, so any, any knowledge. So that's about a that. very hot topic right now. There's even an RFA to look at these drugs and the effects. Uh, you probably have seen it in the headlines recently that um, rapid decrease in, in weight loss, but then it comes back. I don't know if you saw that. And part of it is because of that. It's not just taking the drug, but you also have to follow guidelines. You cannot eat more because you're taking the drug. Oh, now I can do whatever I want. 
So um, we don't know the answer to your question. We don't know because these are relatively new. So we have to see, uh, and I don't know if anybody's looking at diet and what people are doing. Um, again, it's very new. And we have to see the long-term effects in terms of weight loss maintenance, as well as side effects. We don't know that. So yeah, but the main thing is that even if you're losing weight, you still have to uh, exercise because when you lose, I mean, you're going to lose a deposit, but you may also be losing muscle mass. So anyway, exercise is very important for, uh, you know, as you grow older, for all of us, it's, it's very important that we continue moving. So, yes. I have like a general question that I think about a lot. I think I was in undergrad when I heard the fact that like it takes 17 years from us in research for the uh, research to translate to the public and for certain diet patterns and or things like alcohol that we know are bad in research and we see all this in research, we don't see a huge shift in public knowledge. So I was wondering where you see the role of an epidemiologist on like translating this research or what should we be focusing on in the future to make sure that our research is having an impact? To focus on uh, research translation. Yeah, research dietary research. patterns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that, and I think that's where we are, most of us are going, um, looking at dietary patterns instead of focusing on this food or this other food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that it will inform policy. So in the um, the American the 2020 report, there was a section on um, patterns. And I didn't mention the WCRF AICR continuous update. I didn't mention Sonawa, they published in 2018. They have continued. So I'm still involved in an advisory committee. I'm not an expert panel. And one of the ones that they're doing is dietary patterns. So there's going to be a report on dietary patterns and cancer because that's where we're moving. So. Is there any translation to the public besides? You put it, uh -huh. Is there any translation to the public besides the publication? Do you guys, as a group, have you worked on any dissemination to the public besides? for the WC for both? All of them. For American Cancer Society, as I mentioned, there. I mean, I've been invited personally, but they're always going out there and and um, advertising it. WCRF has a whole department that is policy, and it's not just for um, the UK, but it's uh, worldwide. So I forget that, but you can look it up online, and they have policy and the different things that they do for dissemination, and yeah, it doesn't stop there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Pandere, for this informative talk. I have a question regarding age. Since age is one of the considerable risk factors for, for any type of cancer and with increased life expectancy, is there any differences in terms of recommendations for elderly adults compared to like middle-aged adults? No, not specifically the recommendations. Uh, I'm not focusing in groups right now. Um, in general, they are for the general public. They are some for adolescents, a group for adolescents and blah, blah, blah. But for elderly adults uh, right now, no. It's something that probably could be done in the, because a lot of the meta-analysis, they were for heterogeneity, we were looking at by geographical area, by age group. So, but no. Um, but I think for the elderly too, the same guidelines will apply. Eating a healthy diet, exercise, and, and the guidelines, they say um, uh, 150 to 300, but more uh, uh, more is, a little bit is better than nothing, essentially. So it's flexible. So, and the same thing for diet. It depends on, on your, you know, situation and all of that. But I think a healthy diet, because as you see, it also prevents uh, all the chronic diseases. So I think for the elderly, I, I cannot imagine that it will be different guidelines. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm a physician and a researcher. And so when I'm in practice and I talk to patients and I, you know, kind of give them the general lifestyle medicine recommendations, healthy diet, exercise, people think that they're eating healthy. People yeah. truly believe it. Right. And so I say, you know, it just as like a quick follow-up in clinic, 
you know, when's the last time you ate something green? And it's just silence. <laughs> and so I think I'm wondering if in these kind of general guidelines, the general lifestyle thing that, you know, I agree with you, I completely agree with you is, yeah. is correct that without being more specific, people are interpreting what's healthy and what's not. And so I've seen like, for example, um, a recommendation towards like flavonoids, like, have you gotten a, your, you know, a, the, your recommendation of flavonoids through certain foods or, or what? And I'm wondering if there's any thought on, you know, those really healthy antioxidants or whatever, but actually giving people food recommendations to make sure they're actually hitting some of these milestones that we think they're getting by having a general Mediterranean or general plant-based diet um, more than others. I'm wondering if, if there's any thought to kind of going that way too, to see if people can actually incorporate it. Okay. So what I was presenting is big picture, okay. big picture, simplified guidelines and everything. If you go to the American, so the, the guidelines, WCRF, AICR, uh, is combined. American Institute for Cancer Research is the sister organization of the World Cancer Research Fund. They're based in Washington, D.C. If you go to the website, they have specific, they take the guidelines and then they make it practical. So they have the new American plate where they have specific, this is what you should include, specific recipes. Uh, I actually review the new, the uh, it's quarterly newsletter where every newsletter they talk about a certain thing. So it's dissemination of the guidelines with specific recipes of how you can um, apply that. So it doesn't stop there if you dig it a little bit, especially for nutritionists or um, people that work in cancer center with patients and all of that, there's tons of advice that, that they can give. I don't present about that, but now that you have the guidelines, they can make it practical. And it's like, how can you implement this in your kitchen and whatever? So it's like, tons of information if you're interested you go to the website they have brochures that are free and yeah mm -hmm. questions they can't hear you online oh okay thank you um listen to this was like deja vu of dad 20 years ago talking to him about diet and cancer and it just brings back so many memories it's incredible and you were fantastic yeah. i gotta say one thing about booze though the day before he died in bed upstairs in orchard park he said can i have my martini now because it was <laughs> and he liked it with a twist or um an olive so i'll always remember that as well in terms talk about diet and cancer but it was fantastic oh thank so you thank so you. much thank you so much other questions comments and you can come to me individually too if you have questions if you're shy i used to be very shy to to speak up so you i'm around we have one more question online from rochelle who says can you share your prognosis of ER plus stage one after 10 years with a healthy lifestyle? What? I don't know. <laughs> Can you share a prognosis of ER stage one after 10 years with a healthy? Well, we, I don't think that we have a risk prediction model that I can be that specific uh, and tell you the exact answer, so I won't do that. Um, I can say that ER positive and stage one is a pretty good um, Probably pretty good prognosis, but I cannot give you exactly um, the answer. <laughs> there we go. Um, turn back on. Um, any last questions or comments? Okay, well, let's thank our speaker and we also... <laughs> we also have a few tokens of our appreciation oh no this is when i cry <laughs> oh my gosh did i open it you can yeah Oh my God, thank you so much. 